today I will take questions. I have a question about um, about Krishna and why was he why is he depicted as blue? This mythology arose because his skin tone had a bluish tinge rather than a golden tinge. Many of the people of that day, their skin tone had a golden tinge. His was a bluish tinge. Was he black? Not per se, but there was much migration from the African continent into the Indian continent, and there was influence in that direction. There were a mixture of races from those indigenous to those continent to those who were migrated from elsewhere. Are there modern people that have a a similar blue tinge or is this something that's gone now? There are those whose skin toned are so ebony that it seems there is a blue quality to the tinge of the skin. Is it not? But the blue of Lord Krishna is attributed to the blue of the inner pearl the blue of the sky, the blue light of an inner realm that the people thought he embodied like a jewel when their minds became enchanted in his flute and they could see nothing but his greatness they felt this radiance from him. It was his inner radiance that emanated a blue light that those in a state of blissful connectedness would perceive. But over time, these personal experiences became embodied in the legends of the day. Those legends became truths that are known. Lord Krishna was a boy, a dreamy boy, who sat for many hours by the side of the Ganges, by the side of the river, not the Ganges, but the river that runs through amid the forests, playing his flute. Music was a big part of the culture. The people in those times played instruments, simple but beautiful. The life was peaceful and beautiful. And in his boyhood, he was a stunning young man. Krishna is depicted as being blue because there was, as I have said, the blue aura of his, of the blue pearl of infinite love and wisdom depicted as time went on as the color of his skin. But it was a subtle aura that was seen by those enchanted by him, by his flute. They would feel that as if this blue radiance emanated from him. And they felt that there was in his skin a bluish tone rather than the golden tone which was more common in those days. And due to this, he became known 
as a blue. But the blue was the blue color of the sea, the blue of the heart, the blue of love which he brought into the hearts of every person around him. When he played his flute, the music was enchanted, and all who listened fell into a state of bliss. As a young man, he was dreamy, spending hours and hours sitting by the river, playing his flute, perfecting his flute. And his flute conveyed his consciousness. And all who heard it fell into bliss. Music was a part of the culture, an important part. In those simple days in which he grew, and spent much time with the ordinary people, drawing them from their herds and their work to sit with him, to sit with his music, to fall into the states of bliss that surrounded him, to see the blue light of love, to be immersed in love with the divine. This was a time of shelter and of peace before he grew and the desires of men for power challenged each other, sending cousin against cousin, brother against brother in a war, as all wars, for power and territory. Krishna used those times to bring forward his messages for dharma, for truth, much in the same way that Christ used the parables of life, the story of his life, to enact a story to carry through the centuries the message of the profound possibilities of human life. Much in the same way, the stories of Lord Krishna embodied and carried the message of truth He utilized the situation to embody a story of profound truths, to embody messages that could be carried through the ages, through people that would not die with the transition of his physical form. Those messages, those teachings would live for thousands and thousands of years. His story would live for thousands of years. So those truly great masters, destined to bring words and wisdom that is to carry through the ages, to guide the human race, have embodied in story, in the stories of their lives, the great teachings they are giving to the humanity, the stories of wars, of struggle, and of conflict can be beneath the surface, the stories of truth, of dharma, of love, of compassion, of bhakti, karma, and wisdom, jnani. So Lord Krishna gave teachings, 
and they carried through the ages and were recorded some years after, some long years after. But they were oral until then, carried a story that carried through the ages, a wisdom that carried through the ages. Because the greatness did not die with the physical man. The embodiment held such a wave that it carried through the ages, then was recorded and continued to carry the essence of Krishna the essence of the love that he brought to this world and of the teachings he gave, the messages he conveyed, the truths he embodied in the midst of human conflict became a story for ages to come. And today that same story exists. And the teachings that he gave are foundational in the minds of people throughout the world. Thus is the power of the great masters. Christ also had this power because the human body, form, mind is only a human But that great divine consciousness which embodied in that human form, which took manifestation in that human form, that Mahasambhuti, that high, great embodiment, Literally it means ma, maha, my, high, sambuti, some great embodiment of divine consciousness finding suitable form in bodies. And thousands of years later, the teachings remain. And even the stories of the blue Krishna remain. So these great great masters are not ordinary people for they embody an aspect of the divine being. The Mother Mary also embodied a great aspect of divinity. She brought to the earth the greatness of the Divine Mother and created a wave which would go on for thousands of years. Thousands. The Kuan Yin also was a human who embodied the greatness and showed the teaching of great, great compassion and love. Lord Shiva was also a person. And the teachings of Shiva remain today, though he is ancient in human terms. He never left this planet. He was the embodiment of this great force of divinity. He brought that to the world early on and with it many teachings and revolution for humanity. Each of these great, great masters have brought teachings well beyond the embodiment 
they took. For they are embodiments of the cosmic mind, the cosmic essence, come to further the evolution of living beings, embodying in a suitable form, bringing aspect of the cosmic mind, the cosmic existence, to embodied form, to speak, to teach, to give to living beings what they need. And those teachings are of such strength. They go on and on. Why? Because that cosmic essence, that cosmic power remains alive in the teachings. And there are those who, feeling the teachings, touch that source. And in themselves, they become the vehicle again of the living presence that goes on and on, alive, the presence of the infinite in this world, there to touch living beings so that they may find their way to truth, to honor, to love, and finally to surrender into the great infinite whole of being. There is one truth, one love, one dharma. The great masters have embodied this and taught each the lesson that was needed to be brought to the planet. And in that teaching, they have restored balance kept the humanity directed towards the whole, towards the one eternal truth. And so humanity has been guided, directed through the ages. Now humanity faces a great challenge a great evolutionary leap. The human race is capable of great advances and great destruction and now must choose to survive, to follow great advances or to drown itself in its own greed, selfishness, and aggression. Now is the time of choice. Human beings have been given the answers, been given the guidance, and are guided in this great time of need. You must look to the divinity within you and find that great guidance and be yourself a light in the darkness. Be yourself one to walk through the darkness holding the light for all who might follow. And thus a thousand lights, a million lights, will light the way, and humanity will turn towards the light, out of the darkness of ignorance, pride, and selfishness, to find the way of love, the way of Parama Purusha, of the Divine One, That one has not forsaken humanity. 
Humanity has been guided through the ages. Do you not think in this time of need guidance will be there? But in each age it comes in a different way. This is a new age. There is a great change occurring. Dharma will prevail. In the light of a thousand souls, in the light of a million souls, of millions of souls, lighting the way of truth. The teachings of Lord Krishna remain alive today. The teachings of Lord Shiva remain alive. And those modern masters bring them forward. The divinity continues to guide living beings and in the frequency of the age to come, it is more accessible to the ordinary person. That connection to the divine source, that that source may work through you, may embody through your form and your actions. This is more possible now. The frequencies are changing and the light is coming closer, brighter. It is ever more possible. This is not the coming age of masters, but the revolution of people. who bear the light, the light bearers. Be such a light bearer in this world. Let that infinite love, that infinite presence, utilize you to be a beacon of light in the darkness of greed, anger, and selfishness. Those that were embodied in the great masters remains, it remains always. It's gone nowhere. Those masters, that which was Krishna, that which was Shiva, that which was Mother Mary, the Lord Christ, the Kuan Yin, They have not gone anywhere. That which was there is eternal and immortal, not a person who dies. That eternal and immortal embodied, but it remains now, now. Be with that, all right? Namaskar.